So uh, welcome everybody um, to Gazelli Art House. Uh, my name is George, and um, I work here for the gallery. And uh, what we what we do for every exhibition is is we try and incorporate a kind of educational program. And usually they um, uh, uh, take the form of panel discussions or artist talks. Uh, and what what we what we're trying to do um, really with this talk is rather than sort of discuss Giovanni's work directly. We've, we've taken a sort of element of his work as inspiration for, for, a, for a different subject. So um, the, the piece that we're kind, of, that kind of links to this talk is, is this piece behind us here. And this piece is a, a, a depiction of um, a map of the world and the way that the world has been uh, created or mapped. Um, Giovanni has collected different explorers' routes over uh, history. Um, and uh, um, so it got us to sort of thinking about this idea of travel, and travel is also sort of consistent uh, theme or subject in Giovanni's work too. Uh, but what we w wanted to talk about tonight was um, globalization and uh, how um, uh, globalization uh, in relation to visual art um, and how uh, 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 contemporary art in, in sort of relation to our sort of globalized society. Uh, so tonight we're, we're really um, grateful to have with us Giovanni Otsula, who is the artist whose wo wo wonderful work you're looking at here. Uh, we have Meredith uh, Gunderson, who's an international uh, curator, and uh, Jonathan Harris at the end, who is uh, an author of, of several books. One of them is uh, Globalization and Contemporary art. So, um, yeah, uh, all sort of pertinent guests. <laughs> uh, and I think I'd like to start off by um, really asking the sort of basic first question, which is, uh, what do we mean by uh, globalization? And uh, in what ways uh, has it affected visual art practice? Mm. And I'd like to maybe ask that question to Jonathan <laughs> first. So, uh, surprise, surprise, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a... Uh, Complex word, and it's a, a noun, but it's a noun of process. So mm. it, it means a continuing process which is happening, which we've given this name to. So it's a thing, but it's also a thing which is changing. And I think we all have some uh, experiential or anecdotal senses of what globalization means, which is things like uh, uh, travel around the world um, constantly, and that becoming a cheaper and easier process. Food becoming available from all over the world in, this, in, all, in all other places. These are the most obvious kind of examples of what globalization means. But my work has been been um, based on the idea of trying to analyze the systemic elements or systems within which uh, culture and the arts have been globalized. So uh, that book, Globalization and Contemporary Art, which was published in 2011, is a big anthology of essays by over 30 critics um, and historians and theorists from around the world, all talking about um, art from particular places that these, and I selected these authors because they all were global. They came from all over the world, and most of them from outside of the West, outside of Western Europe and North America. And they, the point of the book was to bring together these authors talking about um, the development of contemporary art where they lived or, ba or were based in relation to a system throughout the world which is, I think, I don't think this is controversial or anything, dominated still by Western institutions. So I'm concerned particularly with the way in which there is an art world system which is globalized in economic and institutional terms and dominated still by institutions from North America and Western Europe, talking about auction houses, um, uh, museums and galleries, and we have some in London, of course. So my take on globalization in relation to culture and the arts is that it's about how um, the activities of artists from all parts of the world, and I do mean nearly all parts of the world, have become appropriated, taken up within a system which is uh, international and based in terms of its dominant institutions still in Western Europe and North America. So that's my initial take on globalization. Mm -hmm. Does that help? That's very helpful. Yeah, that's excellent. And um, Meredith, so uh, we're talking, let's, let's take that a little step further, and what we're talking about is a homogenization of some kind of visual culture. 
Um, and uh, so, Meredith, um, how do you, as a curator, is, uh, is homogenized visual culture necessarily a bad thing? No. Okay, <laughs> and why not? Um, uh, I th the way I see globalization is, is a behavior, and so you give a very good kind of macro view of what's going on in institutions and so on. And for me, as a curator, it's all about the work, my, you know, what speaks to me. So I like the the micro view of globalization, the nano sort of view of globalization, and looking at how we sit and live in postmodern culture within globalization, this sort of westernized capitalistic situation that we're in. And then these experiences of living in our time inform the art that we make. So you have very personal and unique experiences of globalization. And so, to me, this is what's very interesting, when an mm -hmm. artist can bring, f bring forward something personal, but it also resonates as this experience that we're having in this mm -hmm. sort of global village kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah? Um, and homogeny, what is homogeny? You know, if, if, we, if, if it means we have more and more intersecting points on the internet and museums and so on and so forth, I don't really think that that's so bad, you know, that we're communicating and so on. I think homogeny is a bit of a, a, bit of a loaded word. You know, of course, mm. we don't want to see ourselves as homogenous. No, sure. Um, and uh, I don't really see it as a problem if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, the art world, when I first started curating in about 1996, first started working in museums, um, it was radically, radically different than what it is now, and that's okay. Mm. You know, it's changed a lot. Okay, yeah. interesting. So there's a sort of, there's a history of visual objects having links with national identity and um, I mean, take like the British Museum, for example, these, these museums sort of divided into um, uh, n like nations. Yes. Uh, so how do you think history is going to assess this sort of globalized era with that in mind, without these sort of national uh, identities and social contexts well, of these objects? That lovely mess of postmodernism, you know, where mm. you ha it's open source. We have to find our way through everything where you know this onslaught of information and visual culture that we have and it's like in london i think of london it's like a rushing river and if you try to stand in the river and drink the whole thing in you're gonna drown you know it's no good for anybody where, where it's dipping in and out <laughs> finding your way picking and choosing your own sort of avenues through okay. things um so a loss of national sort of identity <laughs> is not necessarily a frightening uh, not prospect. To, not to me. Uh, well, these but obviously we've had major national museums that have been collecting objects from around the world for centuries. So globalization is not separate from the history of imperialism. Yep, so Again, yeah. a process that's dominated by Western countries. Mm. Um, what's changing now, I think, is that there's a new set of you know new, new institutions that have a very different conceptual philosophical framework. For example, M plus in Hong Kong, you know, which is still hasn't happened yet, but the, the, the philosophy and the, the conception behind M plus is this extraordinary um, museum of visual culture, to use that term, but really a, a collection that's begun now rather than this you know, historically accumulated massive objects that the British Museum or the V&A has or any of these you know, l l larger kind of uh, Existing institutions. So I think there's a there, mm. there are a, there's a new set of institutions, which are being formed now or in the last ten or fifteen years, which have got a different kind of take on what globalization means, as opposed to how imperialism operated in the mm. 19th century mm -hmm. mm. and early 20th century. Yeah, it tends the subject tends to provoke quite strong um, views. So, so, so let me read you a quote from Robert Store, who wrote in the Art newspaper. Uh, the ecosystem of the global art world is like that of the planet itself, overheated and dire. 
Aww. Rather than expecting a cleansing cataclysm, we can look forward to a relentless melting of aesthetic dis distinctions, dissolving of institutional barriers and fusion of cultures, resulting in a sludgy, sulfurous magma laced with gold. <laughs> So it's not yeah, particularly yeah. pro uh, <laughs> that sort of yeah, like, his view. Yeah, yeah one yeah. nation sort of uh, visual um, uh, culture. So, so why why do you think this subject brings up kind of uh, uh, why does it press people's emotional buttons when we talk about? I I've, I think that we s like I think that we were we've been taught in a way maybe through school to, that there are you know we're still perhaps in like a bit of a Victorian or imperialistic sort of model of knowledge and certain experts and so on. And this way of learning mm -hmm. is sort of changing and people mm. find this uncomfortable. Mm. You know, this, again, this sort of open source sort of way of finding your way through. Sure. Uh, more vertical. Yep. Much more horizontal. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, actually, I find very interesting because there is no kind of boundary. We are mm -hmm. not talking anymore about country, but more about humanity as a group. So it's sure. not like, and each mm -hmm. one of us <coughs> bring his own way of being the world, you know? So it's kind of, I, I find very interesting to see how for a, I don't know, a Chinese collector or a Chinese artist is his word, his way of looking at the world. So I think it's a kind of, uh, I mean, it's true that there is like a um, uh, homogenization. How do you say that? Kind of, uh, yeah, that it flat everything. You can see the same work from a Chinese artist, from an African mm -hmm. artist to a Canadian artist. That's the sad side. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you can see something totally different from your way of being the world, your point of view. That's the, the enrichment sure. that globalization gives us. For, for instance, I, I was in, last year I was in uh, China, and I spent two months there. I was producing some work, uh, some works at the CAFA uh, University, is the, the biggest um, art school in, uh, run by the state in, in China. And uh, you could see many Ai Weiwei, you know, tons of Ai Weiwei mm. working, doing the same work over and over. But then you would see something very, very specific, something very particularly that is, uh, and I would never see that if there was not this kind of globalization. Mm. Do you think Ai Weiwei's work looks Chinese? Uh, not particularly. No. <laughs> um, is there, uh, let's Actually, talk a bit about biennials. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about biennials? This is, there's a big kind of um, uh, uh, interest in global biennials. Apparently, there are 80 international biennials this year. Whoa. And um, I wonder if biennials address local art production. And uh, Jonathan, maybe you could draw shed a bit of light on, on yeah. what biennials are and what, what well, they, function they yes. serve. Yes, I, mean, I think they, I, I, the number I heard recently was 100 and over 130 mm. uh, events. They're not all biennials. Some, sometimes they happen every three years or whatever, every mm. five years. But the idea of this you know, um, repeating uh, edition, as they call, like to call them as well, I think. Um, well, I went to the first edition of the uh, Indian Biennale in Kochi two years ago. And that was a good um, example of, a, of an event that both tried to match what it thinks of as being the quality that's reached by the best biennales everywhere else. So in that sense, mm -hmm. standardization as opposed to homogenate. You know, so mm -hmm. these terms have slightly different evaluative meanings to them. Standardization can be a good thing if it means quality. But homogenization is a bad thing if it means everything's the same. Mm. You know, so these terms all have rather nuanced significances to them. But what they were trying to do in Kochi was, and it's an artist organized biennial, was to both match what they thought of as the quality of international standard bien biennial art, at the same time have a very local kind of um, uh, response. So th th they did that in a number of ways. They made sure that over half of the artists participating were in fact Indian born. 
or Indian resident artists. And within that, um, a few, quite a few were actually from Kerala State in the, in the south of India. And they made a lot of the work site-specific, so they invited a lot of the artists to come and actually work or visit the place, visit Kochi before the, the biennial and to, 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 to find out about the history of the place and the geography and all the rest of it. So the, it did, that exhibition did definitely attempt to have a very um, authentic local take on the culture of the place, while maintaining this idea of, 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 of international, global, you know, biennial standards. So it wants to have it both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this term, the glocal, I'm sure you've all heard. Glocal. It's usually, <laughs> yeah. Local. yeah usually uh, turned out mm. at this event. So that was an example of, I think they pulled it off in a way as well. I, mean, it was, I think it was a reasonably, didn't attract that much publicity, the, 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 the first Indian Biennale internationally. But I think of the reviews that I did see, they actually, they were on the whole, they were quite uh, positive. And they managed to bring in, obviously, some of the most well-known Indian contemporary artists who have a global you know, profile, basically, mm. but also had in lots of lesser-known, perhaps, um, Indian artists uh, who, who, as I say, were asked to address um, very much the culture and specificity of Kerala and Kochi itself. And is that quite a common curatorial thing for biennials, or is that, was, that a, yeah. was that more specific to that? No, I'd say it's one. actually now become a kind of almost a cliche of how, what you have to do to make right. a biennial um, meet this kind of notional idea of an international standard. But I think if you go back to the history of biennials, which is quite complicated and um, diverse, they, they don't all follow from an, a, a similar, you know, a single route or anything. It was the Havana biennials, uh, which started in the 80s, which actually were the first ones to try to address uh, what we would still call third world Right. Places that were usually excluded in many ways <laughs> from the Western, the North American or Western European biennials. So it was Havana that actually pioneered that idea of, of, of bringing, and bringing up these artists from third world countries to, to Cuba and to do that work in a very political context as well because they were making points about how the, the international art system was even more at that stage, in one sense, homogenous and narrow because it was dominated only by a few countries in the, to the north. Mm -hmm. um, so that the, the South, South Biennial movement, which is part of this history as well, has always had an interest more, in a sense, in the idea of, of the local and the politically local, as it were, and then the South and then the South in relation to the North of the world, as it were. Um, but I think the other point to stress is that all biennials have quite specific histories, um, and it's, it would be misleading to try to um, uh, see them all as, let's say, following from a single development or having the same objectives. Mm. They actually have, often have quite different objectives. Mm. But nevertheless, the weird thing is they all start to look the same yeah. the, more like, the more you go to them. Yeah. And that's a, yeah. an experiential kind of question that needs to be... Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting it's because the sort of consequence of this a globalised sort of society is this idea of, like, visual sameness. And what I'm kind of interested in is, is there, is there a sort of dominant culture that's led from that, like, visual language? And if so, what um, culture does that stem from? Mm. Probably be a Eurocentric kind of thing, mm. you know, and quite unhelpful. I quite like going to a somewhat shambolic kind of situation, exhibition can be interesting. Mm. I mean, the biennials too, and, and indeed as well the art fairs, which are also of course driven by the market. I mean, there is audience for all of this. We're curious about each other. We're curious on a global scale and at the moment these mediums are very popular and governments recognize this. People that are selling art recognize this. People that are selling parasol sunglasses, you know, it's like it all fashion and brands and so on, hmm. people like it. It's quite depressing, isn't it? <laughs> what no. is depressing? Well, it just feels like there's some, somebody's not getting represented. Is there, mm. I mean, is that, is that a fair sort of comment, do you think, that there's, there's Possibly, sort of a group of people no. that aren't being presented or that they're just being subsumed into another culture and in order to be represented at those international fairs and biennials, they have to adopt a visual language that isn't really historically their own, but is the dominant sort but of culture. But they, they have to make their own choices, and that's making a poor choice. But it's like, if you want to be in those things, you've got to be making work that fits in with... 
yeah, what the curatorial aims internationally are of those mm. institutions and biennials, right? I think there's I a don't know. sorry. Yeah. Giovanni, yeah. You, you, we, you haven't spoken for a while. No, no, I mean, uh, it can be, yeah, it can mm. be, it can be a solution. <laughs> the art yeah. world is not but fair, you know, yeah. it's not going to be perfect. Mm. Yeah, but like uh, every, every, I mean, world. Uh, every, yeah, every, yeah, every hand of world. And I think actually that, uh, I mean, it's true what you say, but more you try to do your own work and you don't conform to a mainstream and more you, you, you define mm. yourself mm. as something unique or less conform, you know? Mm. Uh, it comes to me, uh, the work of Pascal Martin Tayou that uh, is shown here. I mean, he's, he's an African uh, from Nigeria, I don't remember from, uh, from where. Hmm? Cameroon from Cameroon, and um, I mean, he's in Ghent, and uh, he's doing his work, he's always did his work. I remember him, the first time that I met him, I was in Tokyo in 2001, and he was collecting plastic objects mm -hmm. and doing installation. So he kind of followed his path, and he, ha he now is recognized for what he, he is, and his point of view, and he, his way of being the world, how he represents the world. Mm. So I think it's true. It's, it's something like a, a highway to get an international audience. It's to be conform on a certain aesthetic, certain meaning, you know. Mm. But at the end, how, how many years do you, can you, can you be yeah. there? And, you and, wha and wha where's the space for creating new things in that context? Excuse me? Where's the space for creating new things in that context? Yeah, I mean... If you have to conform... Yeah, that's the thing. If you do conform to, to, get, an, uh, to get an international audience in an easier way, I mean, you can last for some years how the trend is going, mm. you know, for the time that the trend... But at the end, you, you will be forgotten. So I think the only way is to be yourself and try to do your work and to not be conform. Mm. Yeah. That's the interesting. Thing. I mean, yes. otherwise, it's a very um, optimistic <laughs> view yeah. of the view of how it works. I mean, I, I think um, if you go around to uh, art fairs, perhaps more than biennials, it's definitely the case that there are artists now who are producing works to be sold in art fairs True. directly, mm. immediately on production almost. Well, well yeah, but with the direction of their gallery too. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. not all artists do that. So there's there's as much uh, diversity as you can you're, as you're prepared to find out about. I mm. think in the contemporary art world. But mm. if you only go to, you know, art fairs or a few of the top biennials in the, in, if you know, if you go to Freeze or um, uh, the Venice Biennale, mm. th those are quite different events from all of the biennales that happen in most other parts of the world. Mm. Because the capital of the, you know, the contemporary art world is, is London and New York, basically, and Venice for the Biennale. But apart from that, Italy is almost doesn't register in the contemporary art market. It has a tiny amount of sales. So it's, it's New York and London that dominates entirely. So, so you, you, know, you go to Freeze or you go to the New York Art Fair, whatever it's been rebranded at recently, the work you will see there will not be about Brooklyn mm. in the way right. that if you go to Kochi, you know, or anywhere, or anywhere else in the world, or Hong Kong for Art Basel Hong Kong even, which is just a, a kind of, you know, Art Basel bought Hong Kong three years ago, the Hong Kong Art Fair. And still though, there's a sense in which um, Art Basel Hong Kong wants to address the local context because Hong Kong is still a satellite to London and New, to London and New York within mm. the way the contemporary art market works. Yeah. So I think that's a very important distinction. Yeah. Well, I saw what, like when going to Hong Kong Basel, I felt like I didn't know where the sort of project spaces were in Hong Kong, where the art schools were. It was no real obvious engagement from the organisers to kind of show people what the scene was like in Hong Kong. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I, didn't visit, I didn't see any of those, like, non-for-profit spaces. It has got better. There schools. are quite a few of them, but you need to know, do the research, basically. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, so it's developing, it's growing. I mean, I think the posit one of the positive things about Art Basel Hong Kong, because I think you can look at the pros and the cons, is that it has, has actually stimulated the visual infrastructure in Hong Kong in mm. economic terms. Right. Um, and that's good. It's producing jobs and it's producing work, you know, and, th th you know, and that's an important development for Hong Kong, I think. But on the, on the other side of it, you could then talk about whether or not there is this, an art fair style. You know. Yeah. And to, to, to talk a bit more about the, the um, market, I've got a quote here from a philosopher called Peter Weibel, who says, universal culture a knowledge of the same languages, literary and visual works, all become the fraternal signs by which the capital accumulators of the world recognized each other. This universal culture was something that one needed to assimilate to, and historically it aided the expansion of capitalism uh, worldwide. <laughs> That's quite a quote, isn't it? Isn't that? Yeah, it's quite a dramatic yeah. quote. Is that, yeah. What is he saying? What is so he's saying that... The, that um, to, in order to, for those uh, visual works... Uh, Is he talking about collectors or...? Well, he's talking about um, the idea of the, the sort of relationship between universal culture and a capitalist-like system mm -hmm. and the idea of recognisable uh, signs that... Uh, to who? To whom? To, uh, presumably, to... Um, Accumulators. Geo blocks. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, to ac accumulators of uh, 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 contemporary art. Oh, see, I think that you get some amazing collectors that do uh, wonderful things with their collections and build. I mean, they have so much freedom sometimes with what they do with their collections. Mm. I don't. I don't particularly share in that view. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit cynical. Yeah. yeah. The, this, this, I, I think what we're addressing, we sort of talked about this idea of art for art markets and yeah. for art fairs. Mm. Uh, and sort of Does assimilating happen. into this visual culture as a way of like appealing to people that want to buy those yeah, you know, it artworks and those art fairs. It happens. Um, I think one of, the, one of the real problems and difficulties is when you go to an art fair or, or to a biennial, there is just so much material. We were just saying yeah, it's, it's the worst way to see it art. It is impossible <laughs> to assimilate or really understand all of the things that you see, because it's not really about that. It's, it, the quantitative issues around analyzing contemporary art bleed into the qualitative issues about whether or not you think it's good or bad. Yeah. You're, f you're just hit by this avalanche of work. Mm. If you go to Art Basel Hong Kong or whatever, and you cannot possibly make sense of it all and spend the time you would need to to, to try to understand it. And the danger is that that produces a, a quick response. I'm not saying this is the response from this critic, but it can produce a quick response. So it's all the same. Mm. But, but that's, the, that's, the, that's registering the, the problem of trying to make sense of this huge array of material that you're exposed to in those events. Yeah, so the and sort of physical experience of being at those fairs and biennials so. is like, there's yeah. so much to see. Yeah. It becomes quite a sort of yeah. overwhelming yeah, experience, perhaps. Yeah. 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 But, I, but I think it, it's misleading to see that as a reasoned argument about the nature of what art has become. Mm. And in fact, you could trace this back to the 19th century and say that the arguments about what was called mass culture, you know, the debate around mass culture that began in the, the mid and late 19th century in, in Europe, in a way, was registering the same issues around the development of print media, mm. graphics. Mm. You know, the mm. mass sounds like it means it's an amorphous whole which has no kind of depth to it or any kind of, you know, kind of specificity or interest. It's the same problem, I think, with contemporary art. The sheer mm. amount of it is extremely hard to get any kind of sense sense of or to understand. Um, yeah. And there's also bewildering. It's a bewildering. It's bewildering. Experience. Yeah. But and then it's, sorry, um, go on. I please. mean, no, no, no. It's just that uh, I don't see really the point because I think for an art fair, I mean, I don't go to judge a work in. in uh, I don't see the the art fair as a unique thing. I don't see as a project. I don't see. I I, I don't. I'm not judging a work on an artist in an art fair. Mm. Um, it's something, something completely different from an, uh, a studio visit, uh, from an exhibition, mm. from an exhibition that I'm doing for a commercial gallery, for a uh, uh, non-profit space. Mm. I mean, I each place has its own uh, um, context. context, and you relate to it 
you don't go to for in a um, supermarket to do philosophy, you know? Mm. I mean, each place has its own soul, and you relate to it, you can't ask to something that is a fair. I mean, it is, it, it is a fair. It it's is something it is. for yeah. mm. selling, you know? It's not mm. an art project. Actually, mm. you can do something better. We can say, okay, let's try to do something that is more connected and more linked with an idea, with a place, you know? Mm. But an art fair has its own, uh, you know, its own laws. Mm. No? Yeah. So I'm, I'm not looking for something uh, inspiring in an art fair. I'm, I did buy works in art fair, but because those are artists that I follow from years, uh, that I read about it in my house, and uh, I spot the nice work that I can buy, and, uh, and there, I mean, you know, that's mm. the exper my experience in, in the art fair. But uh, I always see from my individual point of view, I don't see the whole thing mm. as a phenomenon. Yeah. Um, so sort of on a slightly different point, researching um, this subject, I came across quite a lot of um, uh, negative, quite a sort of lot of negative responses about this idea of like one visual global culture. And I wonder whether that sort of linked psychologically to, um, I think that you, men you mentioned right at the start that people don't want to be thought of as being homogenous, homogenous as, mm. as people. You know, there's this, we sort of like fight for our own individuality in some way psychologically. Um, and uh, and perhaps I mean I don't know I mean perhaps it's it's just sort of the the landscape it is what it is and we have become this global culture in some ways uh, and that's just the way things are but it sort of feels like there's this sense of change that's quite unpleasant for people and also the sense of uh, sameness as well which is kind of depressing for people. Mm. Um, I mean, I don't know, Jonathan, you're re researching your uh, books. Yep. It becomes quite an emotive subject. Yep, I think my uh, sense has changed a bit. If you go back to the, um, the first um, kind of generation of writing about globalization and culture, which was really in the late 80s and the 90s, that was when those big first kind of public debates happened around the homogenization, you know, this idea that everything, McDonaldization, everything becoming the same. So there was a kind of moral panic around that, I think, mm. in, in quite the academic and the more popular literature of globalization. But then the next generation of writing about it, in the early 2000s, became more complex. And then it started to, to stress this idea of the global. So a kind of com complex heterogeneity of forms that both combine some elements which are transnational, but often linked to mm. local traditions. Right, um, and that's my experience of, of contemporary art now. Is that it's almost become a kind of cliche as well. And that's another issue to, to, to think about. Is that if you go to the most biennials, um, again outside of Western Europe and North America, it's it's often artists who who are linking um, um, modernist and postmodernist kind of um, stylistic forms to mm. third world whatever you want to call it, local traditions. And you see it in India and Pakistan and China, um, um, and you see it, I think you see it everywhere. So that, that is, but that in itself is a very complex range of things. But it does have that continuity of this modernist um, element or postmodernist element bolted onto local traditions, mm, which might right. be to do with religion or cult or whatever it is. So partly what's going on there, I think, is the... Um, Again, it's, it takes us back to imperialism because it's about the export of the Western art school education model yeah. to all of those countries, particularly the Commonwealth countries. So in India particularly, and Pakistan, you see that because the British took the Western English art school model to those, to those countries, and they st still exist in those countries. Uh, but it's different again in South America. And Africa, I think, is much more diverse and complex, and mm. I think we know far less about it because Africa is still the least assimilated of all of the continents to the contemporary, apart from South Africa, mm. um, essentially. Um, and that's because it's not a secure place for 
the Western institutions to do business. Sure. If it becomes so, it will be the next one. Mm. As we, and we see all those exhibitions in London where they try to bring contemporary artists here. So there's an attempt already to monetize broad, broad African contemporary art. But I mm. think until they actually sort out the security and safety of the business and the legal sides of it, it won't happen, basically. Mm. But we will see the same thing there as well. So, so, so again, there's a sort of example of how the market is linked in a, in a, in a way to institutions that show yeah. For sure. international Absolutely. artworks. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Um, and you're right, you know, you can sometimes go to fairs and certain exhibitions and stuff and it's like contemporary art is becoming a parody of itself. And it's like without the loveliness of knowing simulacra going on or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it can become redundant sometimes. But I think that this just happens when we have so much visual culture. Sure. You know, there's going to be moments of amazing transcendence and there's going to be some other moments of seeing things hmm. yeah cool um i wonder if we could open it up to uh the audience and find out if anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask on this subject uh, i i was interested in your comment about uh sense making and uh that it was in some sense, in, in some sense, con confusing to you, and I'm wondering what, what sorts of forms, what sorts of expressions, would um, more satisfy you, in the sense of sense making, of the modern world. Oh, do you mean outside of the world of contemporary art or within art? Well, within within you. Oh. Oh dear, that's a deep question. <laughs> Sense-making? I'm, I'm, I'm into deep questions, oh, yes. Yeah. Is it me how you make sense? Yeah, I'm just, just <laughs> would you take that question off? I'll figure, I'll figure that out for you. Either, either one of you, either one of you. <laughs> I don't think I, I think understand it. it. I don't quite know how to, can you just say a little bit well, more well about it has, it has to do with what is art about now in these yes. days. Yep. And, and I don't think that it's responding to the needs of contemporary uh, well, individuals. I think from a point and of view of being a critic and a historian, which is what I am, mm -hmm. I find as soon as I start to write about an artist, my depth of understanding absolutely just you know, becomes far more. So I think, I think that mm. if you can actually turn your attention that you might have to an artwork into a piece of writing, you have to, you have to, as you say, you have to actually respond. And how we respond to art is not just a question of looking at it, it's articulation, and how you try and describe the experience of what you see in language, um, which is the beginning of that process of understanding. And then beyond that, if, if you can do it or want to do it, there's the writing about it. So I write reviews of exhibitions, and I write in the, you know, about art in the books that I uh, have put, done recently. Um, that all automatically, well, and through the process, generates a much deeper response and involvement. And, and usually that finds that I can, I find through that process that I, I appreciate everything. <laughs> there's, there's very little art that I don't think has value once you start to actually articulate a response to it. Because they well, can that, That's all very kind. Do you, do, you have, do you find that? Oh, no. Not always. No, I don't dislike or hate many, much art. I'm, I'm intrigued by that because um, one of the interesting things that I saw last year in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam mm. was a series of um, philosophical reflections on, on many of the main pieces there. And they were written in large enough That was Alan de Baton. Yeah, yes. he's a philosopher, oh. and he, he sort of re... I don't know if he re-hung the show, but was involved in curating it and, in, and yeah. sort of added his philosophical... Wow, um, de Botton's got himself uh, in the Reichs Museum. Yeah. And I mention that yeah. because yeah. you talk about the writing about it, and, yep. and yet we, you know, when we look on the walls, we see none of that. And I think that there are, our challenge today and, you know, we, it, it is that... Um, we need to be able to bring together those kinds of thoughts and the kind of feelings and, and impressions and, and, and vividness 
uh, from the purely visual. Mm. And, and that's a huge challenge Absolutely, to, bring, I agree. to bring those two things together. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> you asked about, you know, what is art for and stuff. And for me, very personally, it's always, since I was a small child uh, in a museum near my house, in, all by myself, surrounded by Clifford Stills, it has always been about feeling less alone and some kind of connection. Um, but that's a very personal thing. And sure. Does anyone else have any questions, comments? Anything they want to add? Heckles? <laughs> just, to, just to build on that thought. Um, identity, Giovanni, probably predominantly the question for you, but if you both also want to comment on that, how important is it for you <clears throat> in terms of you know, when one looks at the very or quite diverse body of work that you have, for example, at the gallery here, or generally looking at your body of work that you've started back when, um, way back when, how important is it that, you know, they look at this work or the photographs upstairs and they say, you know, they being the audience, and they straight away make that link with, with you? And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, the um, there is the show and that is composed by each work. So each work has a kind of combination with, with, with the other and how a, a person relate to it, it's, it's really became a, a, an experience. And uh, I think for me, in individuality, th that's the thing. I really love, I, I love philosophy, I love writing uh, and, um, but for instance, I would, feel some i mean if i see an art piece and somebody else is writing something next to it i think that is really uh, i mean it's very can be very interesting but is kind of uh, uh, is pushing you towards a direction and i like to have an experience by my own with my my with my story with my history you know with some with, with my mythology with everything that builds me so uh, in each work, each of my work has this. Uh, it's built by by my my vision. So uh, I think that each one of us should be free to read uh, the work in, uh, in their own way. I think that's very very fascinating, and uh, you. You can be less alone, you know, when you when you something match with you. Uh, I find very interesting as well the 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 collectors when how they how they uh, attract when it's done with with their mind, with their with their soul, with their heart. When it's done with uh, purity, they do collect all the mage that are linked with 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 them, you no. Know? And and when you see the whole collection all together, you see uh, an experience. So each one of us is bringing an experience on this world and we share, we can share it. And that's the thing uh, that for me is very, very important. Even in my work, I try always to share something that is linked with me, with my individuality. You know, uh, like in the photo upstairs, I mean, in all my work, there is always a big contrast where uh, in darkness, you, you, I, I find myself, um, I have perception, I have awareness of myself, while into light, I can kind of, I kind of lose my, uh, uh, my individuality. And, uh, you know, into light, when you mm -hmm. lose yourself into light, you are less alone again. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a beautiful text wrote by Perluigi Tazzi that is really saying this, that, uh, you lose in a landscape, you lose yourself in, in a work, and you are part of everything. So, and I think that um, nobody should push you too much into it. I mean, I think the art piece, the art pieces, the, 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 the pieces together are bringing you where you should be, where you should go. <laughs> Anybody else? 
All right. Oh, you so that question? Far from that question, but you didn't answer the question about how you feel about being represented as, you know, from a certain place. Excuse me? Well, didn't you ask how you felt about mm. being Are represented you, as mm. Italian or, or just from a global community? How do you mm. want to be... I, 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 you know, I don't really mind. I mean, I would really appreciate to be taken as Giovanni Zola, you know, with my way of being, with my, my experience, my childhood in Florence that we were talking before, that it really changed my point of view. Then with my experience, each one of us has his own mythology. It collects images, symbols, experience. So, uh, you know, it's true that we, we are local and at the same time we are global, you know. But I think the, the, the interesting part of globalization is, is to not to be standard, but to bring your own identity with your culture and share with the others. Otherwise, it's just something flat. So, yeah, I would like I, I'm always very interested to learn where someone was born, where they've lived, after I've looked at the work, of course. But I think that that's... Yeah, that can be very interesting. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's relevant in ways. I think the, uh, the most critical questions for dealing with art from outside of Western Europe and North America, because part of, part of the globalized art system is branding mechanisms for art from other parts of the world within this main theater of, of, of Western Europe and North American institutions. So, you know, Saatchi organizes an exhibition called Contemporary Art from Africa. <laughs> you can't imagine that ever being used to describe art from Europe or from North America. So the, the big, and this is one of the most litmus tests for how the art world system globally is, as, is asymmetrical. The power relations are held, you know, in, in, the, in the northwestern part because of and it's demonstrated through that marketing and branding of people through their ethnicity if you come from outside of, the, of Western Europe and North America. So, you know, you mentioned Ai Weiwei earlier on. There are a few examples now of artists from outside North America and Western Europe who've kind of got into this pantheon. Mm. So Weiwei is not quite Chinese in the way that, you know, um, Zhang Peli is Chinese, for instance, because of his living in New York for, for many years. But generally speaking, this is a very good you know, indicator of, the, of, as I say, the asymmetrical power relations that outside of Western Europe and North America, your identity is very much branded in terms of your non-European, non-North American ethnicity. It brings yeah. to me, it brings expectations to the work quite often. If you say yeah, someone's of born in Costa Rica it's or... It's part of the branding technique. Yeah. 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 And you have that cultural baggage you bring to the work, poten potentially maybe not in every case, but that's... Why it's always like you have your biographies in the yep. same space as the work is being shown. People can see where you've come from and what you might have brought culturally to the work that you're making, and then it's effaced by whatever you choose to do in terms of you know the, the pract your practice and what you hang on the walls or in mm. the space or whatever. And if you draw that process back historically into the 20th century, you could see it, you could see how it actually um, began in a way with the United States. Because it was only in the 1950s that abstract expressionism was called American abstract expressionism. It was badged as the first authentic style from North America, from, from the mm. US. Because although we'd had American art before 1945, it wasn't until Rothko and Pollock, many of those artists being in fact Europeans, exactly. you know, <laughs> were badged as the first Americans. So that was the same kind of, not quite ethnic, but badging in terms of a national mm. identity. And that's been expanded now to the whole of the rest of the world. And US art, like Western European art, has become universal to use mm. that, you know. Yeah. And I think so that's the sort of point, isn't it? It's like normative. It's, there's, there's been, a, the, yeah. over, over that period of time, there has been a dominant visual culture that has yeah. drawn in yes. other cultures. If Absolutely. You know what I mean. Or that they have yeah. to conform Sloppily. to. Yeah. In a kind of sloppy way. Yeah, yeah. And with a little bit of post colonial guilt. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, in 1992, um, there was a massive debate about um, pan-Europeanization of design, and it rather blanketed the conceptual side of creative graphics, um, interiors, architecture. 
into a, a pan-European style. Do you think when you're talking about homogenized, do you think that's going to happen with the European and um, American markets? Because there seems to be a greater interest in this um, ethnicity um, artists from outside the core sort of Western world. Do we think it, it's going to be sort of pan, you know, the, 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 we're going to lose the creative right. core yeah. of the European world. You mean like and looking at it in retrospect because I'm like, oh, maybe. <laughs> 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 but I don't know. Uh, who who made this pan? So this pan European, pan -European design. Does, yeah, um, uh, this, you got uh, Saatchi, and they combined with Michael Peters and uh, Pentagram, and there was okay. a core panel of these big agencies. Uh, I guess people can say what they want. I guess it depends on who listens to them and what sticks and. Time will tell. I mean, certainly we look back. I mean, you would know, you know, being an art historian, yep. we always are kind of, you label things and you know that it's not quite one, you know, square pegs, with round holes, that kind of thing. And mm. we'll inevitably, well, inevitably, pink things will be categorized poorly. It's, it's, it's a question around the future of globalization rather than it having ended. You know, mm. it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic, volatile process. And whether or not the power can be taken away from northern, north, the north, mm. from northwest Europe and, and North America, mm. um, it's, it's a fairly open question, I think, looking into the, the longer future. Yeah, but mistakes will be made, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's, it's always a risk once capitalism become, became global. That it, that it might actually lose power once it actually mm. seeks to appropriate capital and resources from the rest of the world. Mm. Mm. Um, so the future of China in the world is one of these questions that everyone raises. The thing about China is it's a huge economic power, mm. but culturally, it's very it's mediocre on a global scale. Mm. Apart from Chinese food, probably is, you know, and, and art, but that's a very small. You know, compared with American, the dominance of American culture in the 20th century, yeah. through I, film, for instance. You're talking mm. about being in Kochi, and that we yeah. were in uh, Bangalore this summer, and you go to the Museum of Modern Art, Bangalore, national, a national gallery, so very much a you know, Western European idea of an institution. And it's very interesting walking around and looking at what they, how they represented Western art. Do you think they lost their, their, they're losing their edge? No, I, f I found it interesting how things, you know, this kind of, it's not as bad as parody, but it's about, you know, how things and images move and how people make sense of movements. And particularly, they were really into modernism. There wasn't much postmodern work. And, um, you know, this, these are these European master works that we're sort of aspiring to. And then it, it was quite but that's what's, that's what's sometimes quite distressing about going to national museums of modern art in, mm. like, in India, for instance. If you go to yeah. the one in Delhi, Again, because they've been, they, they, they had the British art school system and art history system in, you know, and kind of internalized it, what, what they produced is this notion of progression in Indian art becoming part of Western modernism. You know, it's the most grotesque kind of uh, take, taking on of this, this, this system from outside of the country as their, national, as their own national culture. They, they, they need to have much more independent systems of thinking about. You know, yeah. And other countries mm. do, of course. You know, they, they, they're not all like India in that respect. And in a very colonial building, yeah. permanent collection, very European, yes. odd kind of collection. So you know, people will go in and think, hmm, European art. <laughs> and that's funny and interesting to me. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you use the word art system, uh, something which, uh, a combination of two words which uh, I hadn't heard before. Mm -hmm. Although I've worked in, you know, 
long ago in, in systems uh, analysis and so forth in, in industry. Mm. Um, and I'm wondering w what kind of impact, what is that, what is the broader meaning of that for you? Because it's, it's an, it's an, for me it was a unique kind of linguistic twist and I don't know what it means. Uh, well, it has <laughs> numerous uh, characteristics to it. I think one of the things that I'm trying to look at is how there is a systemic character to the art, the art world in economic terms. So in other words, we, we, we can look at it in terms of a market, or a set of markets with dominant players, with nodal points. So it, you know, it actually constitutes a system in basic kind of you know, verbal terms. But I think, uh, and it's a system which is loaded and played, and there are dominant players in the system. And then we talked a bit about those. Sotheby's and Christie's, Tate, MoMA, these are hugely powerful organizations which are dominant within this system. But nevertheless, the system is expanding and has lots of other, other nodes and points in it. And it's a, it's a process. It's not just it's not static. So it's a dynamic system. And there's also conflict within it as well. So I think that the account of system that I want to give is the one that actually conceptualizes conflict and change as key to it. So it's not, it's not self-perpetuating. Yeah. It's actually it's constructed in history as well. So it's changing historically. Through time. Uh, well, what, what I just mentioned a minute ago is that the capital, global capitalism has expanded because um, it wants to uh, it wants to appropriate capital and uh, generate profits um, as as much as it can globally. So it has to expand its resources internationally to do that. So Art Basel buying buying the Hong Kong Art Fair is a good example of that, and that brings certain risks as well as opportunities for Art Basel. Because it means that it, 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 it helps to support, it, probably intentionally, but also perhaps unintentionally, the development of other institutions that are local to Hong Kong, which may themselves become more powerful at some stage. So, for instance, if you went to Hong Kong, Art Basel, Hong Kong this year, there was the central show. There was a kind of, you know, there was there was a parallel exhibition run by local galleries who weren't involved in Art Basel Hong Kong. So that's it's the way capitalism works everywhere, is that it generates antagonism through competition, doesn't it? Or the possibility of it, at least. So the system is, in that sense, is, is, um, it's dynamic and volatile and may lead to factors changing the, the fundamental nature of the system. The system might not be reproducible at some stage. It might crash, mm -hmm. as we know the, the, the economic Cap capital system crashed in 2008. So it's feasible that something could crash in the art system, but that would probably be related to broader factors to do with global capitalism, which is in fact what exactly happened. If you look back after 2008, there was an almost immediate um, serious crash in the fall of prices in contemporary art, mm -hmm. but it recovered very quickly. In fact, it recovered more quickly than any other sector of the global economy almost. And that raises interesting questions about why people park their capital in contemporary art mm -hmm. and why they think of it as being fairly secure compared with other, other forms of investment. So it's a system, it's a process, but it's volatile and dynamic and it has to include the possibility of conflict and possibly destruction as well at some stage. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for turning up and uh, I thought that was really exciting and interesting and I hope yeah. you guys got something out of it as well. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, there's one more question, sorry. <laughs> well spotted. Sorry, I didn't see you there. No, I was just wondering, so what, uh, what would you say is the conclusion now out of what we discussed. Uh, I don't think it's about conclusions. It's no, no, about I'm, I'm just... Oh, sorry, yeah, go on. Um, so, because I didn't really understand the opinions whether it is now a real problem in the art market, because, I mean, I see it as a major problem on other uh, aspects of society, like architecture is a problem, mm. or with foods or other stuff, but is it like... I think it's going to be okay. <laughs> I think you just, people just stick with your artistic voice, whatever you're pursuing, whatever speaks to you, and we're going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking. Yeah.
uh, Thank personally. You. I don't know. Well, it's a big question. Uh, yeah. Do you want to Is go everything going to be all right? We, we don't know. <laughs> That's yeah. the nature of capitalism, is we, we, we can't know. We'll see what happens. We'll Maybe survive. It's an internal thing. Everything will be all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think? What, what do, do you, you think? think? From my point of view, it doesn't apply uh, so much to the arts, this problem. That's why I was mm. just wondering, because we had this discussion mm. about this. OK. Um, cool. All right, well, let's wrap it up. Thanks a lot. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming. And uh, I guess we'll see you next time. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, everybody. I'd like to thank Giovanni Otzela, of course. Uh, Mary Beth Gunderson and uh, Jonathan Harris for um, agreeing to take part in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, George. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan.